them. Uh, the first one for Monday was promotion and protection of a musical. Last night was the development of a musical. And tonight we have diversity and equality in musical theater. So we have a great panel lined up for you guys tonight. Um, just a few things I want to talk about. Tomorrow we have our last panel, which is a new form of musical theater, which is not going to be at our office if the address is below. And then afterwards, we're so excited. It's our first Samuel French produced concert at 54 Below. Um, we've got an amazing lineup. We have, oh my gosh, so many people. And now I'm like, uh, Charles Strauss, Amanda Green is hosting for us. We have Joe Iconis, we have Larry O'Keefe, and Kate Schindel, and Emily Skaggs. Um, a huge lineup. Look at 54below.com for the full lineup. And you can also buy tickets there with our little promo code that we have for you all, um, French35, that is the 35% off. So definitely check that out. We'd love to see you there. It's our first one, and it benefits the Drama to Skill Fund. So it's a great cause. So be there. Um, let's see here. Oh, this lovely lady in the front is live tweeting with us right now. And not being rude. Not, she's not being rude. Um, so join in the conversation by following us on Twitter at Mr. Samuel French and also the hashtag Musicals Week. And speaking about live tweeting, we also are live streaming. So hello, everybody who's live streaming right there. Um, it's HowlRound. <laughs> HowlRound is providing for us. And you can check out the video after this one's done. You can share it with everybody and like, oh, it's on this great panel. So share it. Spread the word. Keep the conversation going. And let's see here. Please silence your cell phones. You can join in the conversation for tweeting, but make sure they're silent tweeting. And please, please don't text or you know check your Facebook and all those things. So um, let's see. Anything else? Oh, hold your questions at the end. We will have a Q and A, ten minute Q and A at the end. So keep them to you. And then I'm gonna now pass on the speaking baton to our wonderful moderator, um, Sarah Schlesinger from. She's the chair of the, of the Graduate Musical Theater Writing Program and Associate Dean of the Institute of Performing Arts at NYU Tisch. Um, and she's also an amazing lyricist and librettist. So. Sarah, thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> I thought we just take a few minutes for everybody in the audience to just say their name. And if you want to say you're a writer or an actor, fine. If you don't, fine. But I really think we have um, a subject to discuss that's really helpful to understand who everybody in the room is. And, and you don't have to be coming from any particular place about the subject, but I just think it would be nice if we knew each other. So would you start for us? Sure. My name is Nick Stimler. I'm the Associate Artistic Director at the Palace Theater in Stanford, Connecticut. Great. Um, my name is Laura. I'm a graduate student at the Polite Theater in CUNY SPS. I'm Sam Strom. I'm the Executive Assistant to Mark Rao, Prep President of Broadway Asia, and producer with uh, Richard Frankel, Steve Roche, and Tom Mattel. Uh, I'm Julia Hoke. I'm a freelance director. Hi, I'm Rachel Abrams. I'm a freelance dramaturg, uh, primarily on new plays and musicals. Courtney Kachuba, professional tweeter. <laughs> <laughs> and Samuel <no> French. <laughs> I'm Ryan Haddad. I am a writer and performer with Cerebral Policy, and I am, am a licensing representative at Samuel French. Uh, Jeff Eckstein, I'm a producer and orchestral opera conductor. Barb Carboy, I'm a songwriter, and I've written my first musical. Carlson Bush, I'm with the Lucky Girl Media, I'm a journalist. Danielle Boyven, I'm a writer and actor. Todd Trinia Gerlock, I work in marketing for theater at Theater Mama. I'm Melissa Huber, I'm the managing director of Prospect Theater Company. Cara Reichel, I'm the producing artistic director of Prospect Theater Company. I'm Jesse Kearney, an entertainment attorney, writer, and also work at Samuel Fringe. I'm Francesca Dallas. I'm a student from Stanford, um, interning with the National Asian American Theater Company this fall. I'm Lawrence Lesher. I'm an associate director at Stage Door Manor and the Catskills. Okay. I'm Terry Stratton. I'm the director of education and outreach from the Dramatist Guild. I'm Shakina, transgender performance artist and artistic director of Musical Theater Factory. Ryan McPhee. I'm a reporter at Broadway.com. Adam Grossworth, membership director of the National Alliance for Musical I'm Keith Sherman. I'm the publicist for Samuel French. Great. Hi, Ashton Honest, Music Marketing Associate. Abby Benestra, Director of Corporate Communications, Samuel French. Uh, ben Brown, I'm a pianist and music director. Uh, I'm Ryan Pointer, the marketing director here at Samuel French. Great. All right, 
So we really have a room full of people who come from a variety of backgrounds and have all kinds of great skills that they bring to the table. So one of the first things I think we need to say is about language, that I think it's, it's, it's always a changing palette of how we describe the thing we're about to talk about. And Robert was saying to me the other day that the phrase now that's more trending is color conscious. And yet, that doesn't do anything for Ali over there. <laughs> so we, you know, I think I would like to use the phrase inclusive. You know, that, that how, how do we become a theater of inclusion? And that will also transfer to other issues such as gender and age and all the other ways in which people may differ from each other. Um, there is a very good piece of writing on HowlRound that I came across that was done in 2013 uh, by Carl Stiller. And in that article, she said that we should realize that diversity is, is a noun, it is not a verb. And that to, it is a state of being. And that we are not really talking about something we can do. It's about how are we? What, how, how can we be? And so we want to try to look tonight at the idea of what state of being are we in? I don't think there's any point in going back in history. We all agree that things have not been what they should have been. But we can't change that. So what we have to do is to figure out where we are and how we go forward. And one of the other things that she mentioned in that blog post was the whole question of point of view. And I think that for me is one of the biggest issues. Is She's saying that it's not, it's really about who has, point of view comes from power, point of view comes from decision making, and that it filters down, and that just many times it ends up being a conversation only about casting. And I think it's very important that this is not a conversation only about casting. It's a conversation about how we change the people in power, artistic directors, producers, um, and I think it's also about thinking about the whole variety of people who contribute to the, the, the creative chemistry. And that includes very much, from my perspective, writers and directors. You know, they're all people who are making choices of various kinds along the way. Actually, by the time it gets to Justin, who we'll introduce in a minute, who's like, in casting, Justin doesn't get to decide what goes on Broadway. You know, somebody comes to Justin and says, this is what we're doing. He doesn't get to decide what's at La Mama. He doesn't get to decide what's at La Oida. Somebody else is making those decisions. So we have to look at this in a much broader sense, I think, than just casting. So I'd like you to meet our panelists before um, we go any further. And Justin is the casting director at Telsey. And for, he's been involved in casting numerous projects for Broadway and national tours. And perhaps most significant to our conversation has been involved in both productions of Color Purple, the original and the new, and also uh, this season, On Your Feet. And he has a background in musical theater. I'm not going to list all the shows that he's been involved with and be here all night, but he was actually studying musical theater at Millican University and at Endo. So he's coming from that perspective. So Ali Stroker is an actress and a singer and a dancer and an advocate for people with different abilities. She's currently making history as the first person in a wheelchair to perform in a Broadway musical in Spring Lake. That's very, very exciting. And I've known her since she was a student and just been so excited to watch the progress that she has been able to make as, you know, because of her artistry and not letting, as she says at the end of her resume, she believes that any that limitation can be an opportunity. And I think you're, you're really living that. And we should say that you also have been involved with Glee. Yeah. And that she is, and I will, and perhaps this will come out in our conversation, involved in many, um, as an activist, in many social causes as well. Okay, uh, Michael Jackson, who is not the Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am the Michael Jackson. He is. <laughs> 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 So that was <laughs> but in any case, he has both a BFA and an MFA in playwriting and musical theater from Tisch. And as a songwriter, his work has been performed at Barrington Stage, Merkin Hall, the Laurie Beachman, Ars Nova, Joe's Club, 54 Below, and on and on. And he is the 2009 recipient of the U.S. <coughs> Sosenko Assist Trust Award, a member of Ars Nova's Uncharted Writers Group, and the Johnny Mercer's Writer Colony, and a terrific writer. 
And this is Robert Lee, who was a lyricist and librettist, and his musicals with Leon Bo include Heading East, Chinese Hell, and a stage version of Gene Kerr's Please Don't Eat the Daisies, which was developed by East of Bohemia and the Hoya Playhouse. And his original music, Takeaway, opened in 2011 at London's Theatre Royal Stratford East, and it was the first major musical production in the UK that dealt with the British East Asian experience. Um, he is on the faculty at the NYU Graduate Musical Theatre Program, and he's also an artistic associate at Stratford East, where he is one of the leaders of its musical theatre writing workshop. So we have a group of people with you know, widely diverse backgrounds, and we want to try to look now. Um, and, and I would just like to say before we launch into this that I hope everybody is aware of the work that TCG is doing in this area. And if you're not, you should go on the TCG website and really look at it, because it's a long, multi-year plan to examine diversity, to make some real changes, and they're also doing what I think is really important, is they're establishing baseline statistics. They're really looking at you know, where is the power centered um, so that there is a, an accurate way of saying this is where we are. And then also from there hoping to, to go forward. And doing a lot of work with something that I think we will touch on, which is audience development, because we're not talking about this in a vacuum. And the impact of what we're talking about on audience development. But you should all be paying attention to what TCG is doing because they have the resources and they have really felt a deep commitment to move in this area. So we're going to get started um, with our questions. And I think the last thing I'd like to say before we do that is that I was listening to a replay of Viola Davis is accepting her Emmy. And I don't know how many of you heard that, but she said, um, you know, I, I'm the first person of color in my category. And the only reason for that is because the others didn't have the opportunity. And all we need is the opportunity. So I think that's the kind of launch that I'd like to give. So this, this panel is expressly about the issue of inclusion in musical theater and all that that means. And is there a difference in the way musical theater has dealt with issues of inclusion, do you think, than the theater at large? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, I, I think yes, in a huge way. I mean, part of, just from a writing perspective, um, just from a writer's perspective, uh, you know, I think that it's, um, I think part of what we have to deal with today, specifically, is that, is that we live in a time where, where no music is neutral, you know, where every piece of music that you listen to has all of these associations that come along with it, societal expectations, um, but, you know, resonances, um, and history behind it. And so I think, Part of the thing that's really tricky about musical theater, um, I would say arguably more so than any other medium, is because we're faced with being in a medium where music is such an inherent part of it, I mean, that's such an inherent part of the DNA, and music is not neutral, especially if you're working in, in a popular music um, idiom. It's not neutral, it has all these associations, and so the minute that you put, I, I, I actually think this is, this is part of the issue of musical theater, the minute that you put a person who looks a particular way on stage, you start raising issues of, well, what kind of music is that person going to sing? You know, what does that person sound like? Or, or, or the instant that you have like an older show and you start listening to that music, well, what kind of, what kind of mouth does that music sound like it should come out of, right? Um, so, I think, I, you know, so I think because of that, I think it's, I think it's possibly, uh, musical theater is possibly more problematic than other than other mediums just in terms of getting it right or whatever it is that that means. Is there even a right, you know, um, uh, in terms of casting, in terms of writing? Um, uh, but, you know, but that, but that also I think that the problems that are inherent in all the different, the different mediums is particularly um, exposed in musical theater possibly because of that fact. Um, I mean, just to start with, I would say. Uh, I would also say that I, it seems to me that like musical theater is also comes from such a strong tradition mm -hmm. um, that like the the norms and the practices and the people and the practitioners of those norms and practices sort of carry that on from generation to generation to generation, even as the musical idioms may change or not change, whether you know, we are getting the same revivals that we're always getting, or if it's new shows and rock music is being, you know, sort of uh, uh, 
infused into things, but at the, at the heart of it, you still have that same sort of infrastructure of tradition sort of threaded through all of it. And I think that that can, that can really run you into trouble in terms of inclusivity because then you have like a, a ton of populations that are gonna be excluded because of that sort of uh, history. And also dance. Dance is a huge part of musicals. And, you know, I speak, I'm going to speak more specifically around disability. I think that that brings up um, issues around how someone with a disability would manage the dance part of, of a musical. And so um, that that's sort of where I see that musicals sort of differ in Bigger scope of theater. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I'm not, and just, I mean, it's interesting hearing you talk about that. It also makes me realize this is a part of what I'm saying too, I think, is that musical theater, because music is such a visceral thing, it's like musical theater engages the body in a way that I think most of the other mediums don't. And, you know, that can be incredibly powerful, but that can also be incredibly scary for an audience, right? If there's some sort of a disconnect between what they feel is appropriate for their body as an audience, right? You know, as, as it relates to what they're seeing on stage. You know, yeah, and to piggyback yeah. on that, the expectation. Mm -hmm. The expectation that a musical and this tradition of like the tap dancing and the big musical mm -hmm. number and, and the movement that is expected in a in what you know what we have sort of placed on the American musical. Mm -hmm. You know, and and so that's that's sort of an interesting Yes. And thematically, it's also the fact that you know we're always faced, I think everybody who works in musical theater in any capacity, with the question, how could that be a musical? And you know, our, I mean, my position is anything that has something to say can be a musical, but that, that expectation, how can that be a musical, then automatically kind of screens out certain subject matters that might produce more openness to, to more possibilities. So what does it seem like the right now that the state of being of musical theater in terms of inclusiveness is. I mean, and let's just be as honest as we can. You know, if it's great, great, but if it's not, you know, but, but, but how do you, where do you feel we are on the curve? I mean, like there's this recent Times article about the shows on Broadway this year and, you know, here we go. And so then we want to ask next year at this time, is there another article? I mean, what else is in the hopper? Is this truly a trend? Is this of convergence of when things just happen to have financing and arrive, but what what is really the state, the true state of being of musical theater? The way you feel it in terms of influence? I think it's interesting because I think you know, this season is um, unlike probably many seasons in that you have shows like The Color Purple or On Your Feet or Hamilton, which in some ways are, in many ways, they celebrate a certain culture, and so then you have other shows that where whatever phrase we're using. Colorblind casting is part of the fabric of the show where it includes all types of people, all races, and it's not about particularly celebrating one demographic um, like those two shows specifically are. Um, and, you know, it's uh, to, to quote, if I can, Tommy Kaler, the director of Hamilton, you know, he, Hamilton is color intentional casting. Like it was, that was all intentional. It was part of the fabric of creating that show. It wasn't something that just kind of was happenstance. And so um, I think. From the casting perspective, I can only speak from my personal perspective and my office's perspective, which is it's something, it's an envelope that we are constantly trying to push as much as we can in whatever way we can, whether it's ignoring a directive that we've been given and trying to do something anyways, or um, trying to be as outside the box as many times as we can to see what the reaction is. Um, but I would like to, I would like to believe and think that we're moving, maybe not as fast as I would like, in a direction that feels more inclusive than we have in the past. I think uh, that, I think that we're, we're seeing, like in regards to that Times article, and there was another one that just came out in Time Out New York today, I think, um, that we're seeing a lot on stage, we're seeing a shift perhaps more into what whatever your understanding of diverse might mean in terms of what's being represented on the stage. But what we're not seeing from my perspective is a shift off stage with 
the writers that are being produced. Mm -hmm. Directors, I mean, I, I haven't done a count on that sort of thing, but I definitely think like with directors, like there's so many people who are involved in putting on a musical, and like, and I wish there was some way I could count the representation within those categories of people. Um, because, I, and particularly with the writers, which is my bias, because I'm a writer, but uh, because I feel like what happens is, yes, we have these spaces on stage, but like, from my point of view, like they might not, they might not always match up with the sort of narrative that we create around what is considered diversity, whatever that means to you. I'd like to add something to that. Um, with um, the revival of Spring Week thing that I'm a part of, we get to have, well, a lot of the shows now get to have really cool conversations with people through Twitter. And someone mentioned that there was such a lack of diversity in our show. Mm -hmm. And it took me a minute because I was like, oh my gosh, what's happening is that disability is not even seen as diversity. And it's right now a color thing, or colorblind, or blah blah blah. You know that 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 is what we associate. That's what the younger generation associates with diversity. That disability is not even on the spectrum yet. And um, I really try to be a positive presence on Twitter, but I really, really wanted to reach out to this individual and say, you know, listen, if you're passionate about diversity, you need to educate yourself on what diversity actually even means, because it's not just about race. It's about ability as well. And and so for me, that's that was a shocking moment, because I live in a world, I've been in a chair my entire life, so I live in a world where I'm very aware of this kind of stuff. And I don't like to blame people that aren't, because if you don't interact and, and don't have a disability, maybe it's not even on your radar. But if we're, if we're going to try to push ourselves into this new place of being inclusive, you know, I, I think it's a perfect time that Death West's production of Spring Awakening is on Broadway, and I think that it's a perfect time that someone or myself is based making history with being the first person in a chair on Broadway, and just there needs to be more, because we're not even aware of the fact that that is, that is part of so the so equation. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I mean, I, like, I mean, to me, it's, I feel like we're at, a, we're at a point now where the industry is being very di diligent about treating the symptoms, but that the industry still has a lot of work to do in terms of actually trying to, trying to to, to cure the disease, in what I call the disease. Meaning that I think that, that there is a lot of, I mean, it's a step in the right direction. I think that there is a huge amount of consciousness right now about how the cast, for example, of a show will look, you know, and trying to get beyond the, 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 the more um, the traditional notions of, of, of casting for shows and all that sort of thing. Um, but I, I, I think, I mean, I agree with what Michael was saying, right? I think that, that the real, problem, the real disease, if you want to call it that, is the fact that there's not a huge amount of uh, inclusion on that deep level of, of stuff that's going on, not just backstage, but just even in the conceiving of shows. And I feel like as long as, as those, as long as that, as long as the writers, as long as the producers, um, as long as all of those people who are making the decisions, um, you know, don't make up an incredibly inclusive group, you're always going to be chasing after the particular definition of diversity at the moment, right? Um, and and ultimately, I, I think you know you start you, you start trying to put out a fire here and put out a fire there, put out a fire you know wherever, but new fires keep burning, right? I, I mean, I think in terms of point of view, and that's one of the things you started off talking about. Um, that like I happen to be a person who, um, and I, like I'm very conscious of the fact that with Asian American actors that they're just far more Asian American actors now visible in a way that they never used to be. Um, uh, particularly, you know, particularly when you turn on the TV and you watch commercials and things. There's just so many more Asian American people. And it's great that there's so many more Asian American people that are working on Broadway right now than normal. I have to say that, that, that with a lot of the theater that I go to, I see the Asian American people on stage, 
but as an Asian American person, I don't necessarily feel that my point of view as an Asian American person is being represented. You know, and, and so um, and so personally, you know, I have a very I have a I have a um, odd relationship with seeing a lot of theater uh, that happens um, in the city. Um, not I mean, not just talking about Broadway. I'm just talking about in, in, in general, um, where I see the progress and at the same time I don't necessarily feel the progress because I don't necessarily as somebody who is not on stage, um, I don't necessarily feel that I am included in that experience, right? Despite the fact that the people on stage look like me. Tell us that the people on stage look like me. Um, yeah. And can I piggyback that a little bit? Because I totally agree with you, and the sort of the example that I've been given is that I had an opposite experience of that a season or two ago when I went to go see, a friend of mine works at Clarets Horizons and he got me a comp to see Robert O'Hara's Booty Candy, which is not a musical, but it might as well be, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I saw it four times. So like, um, but like the, the experience I had of it was, there were two things that happened. I, the first time I went to see it, I went in there, we walked in there, I walked to Clarets Horizons. I've lived in New York now for like 16 years. I've been to Clarets Horizons, I used to have a membership, I've been there like a million times. This is the first time I walked in Clarence Horizons, wall to wall, black people everywhere, hanging from the chandeliers. <laughs> and all the time I've been to Clarence Horizons, this has never ever happened. I'm like, oh, that's weird. And the person I was with was like, oh, we never had this many African Americans in our theater. And I was like, well, <laughs> if you build it, we will come. <laughs> then I sit down and like watch the play, and like from the minute it starts to the minute it ends, I'm like, this is like the first thing I saw where it was like literally, literally my experience. At least this one particular scene that was like eerily like from my leg, and I never, like, I, and I had never ever ever had that experience ever, and so I was, came back to see it three more times, and every single time I came to see it, wall to wall black people hanging from the chandelier, and and I just thought that was like really really remarkable because in part because the writer who was also the director wrote something that was so specific and. It wasn't, and it wasn't, it wasn't a diverse piece at all. It was like all black people except for one white actor. And yet, the story that he was telling, the way that he was telling it, was something that could reach so many different populations. And I think that for me in this discussion about diversity, sometimes it feels like if we just sort of have this sort of like, uh, just sort of surface sort of multiculturalism about it, that that's enough, but no, it's actually you have to sort of go into the, con the form and the content, the marriage of those two things, to really sort of get at, to me, a really meaningful diversity. And that's something that I'm really seeking. And so, Booty Candy is like, after the fourth time I saw it, and I went to a symposium, and I Facebook friended Robert Hara, and I met him, and I screamed in his face, and I was like, couldn't believe he broke my leg. Like, that was like, I couldn't have, and like, and I would have paid Hamilton ticket prices <laughs> each and every time just for that experience. So like, I think that that's, for me, when I think about diversity, I'm like always trying to, sort of, to really ask myself, what does diversity mean? It's not just like individual shows, it's like a whole, experience and there's a whole ecosystem there. Really quickly just to, to talk about, you know, it's also something that we're very conscious of within the casting community is, you know, everyone has a different point of view, but to have different people of abilities or of race to have a point of view in that conversation as well because, you know, I don't know many people in casting who are not white. I'll be completely honest. It doesn't exist. And through our intern program and we Try, we try so hard to each season with our interns find someone to give them an opportunity to experience what it is to be in casting. Because I think, you know, when I go to, I go to college a lot and talk and, and with students, and one thing I say is if this is not what you end up doing, this being performing, there are so many other careers within our industry that you can partake in. So please find out what's interesting to you and pursue that. Because that's an opportunity to touch someone who maybe thinks, oh, I don't want to be an actor. Maybe there's something else out there that you can do. And so it's something that I think we're conscious of within the casting community as well, to try to find other people from other backgrounds who are interested in casting and want to be part of the conversation from our point of view behind the table. Can I ask you something? Yeah. 
I think casting in, its, in itself is a very weird thing. You don't go to, you can't go to college to become a casting director. So yeah. how does one become a casting director? It's a very odd thing. I think it's a on-the-job training. Most of us are performers, or we're performers, or we're directors, and so it comes from people who stop pursuing that part of their career but still want to be involved in some way. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, it was like it satisfied an OCD part of me yeah. that putting a puzzle together was interesting, and so that's why I became a casting director. It allowed me to use both parts of my brain, creative and yeah. business oriented. I would think that it's also linked to, maybe I'm jumping the gun on this, but I, I would think that it also <coughs> really, it, it's, it, all of this I think is linked ultimately to who is coming and seeing shows, you know, and who is being inspired, you know. Um, I just, you know, I mean, as, who can afford I, to come see shows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 that's a part of it. And, and it's also, you know, who feels welcome, right, as yeah. an audience, you know, yeah. in, in the theater. I feel like, um, I feel like all of us up here are clearly people who, who, um, at the time that we, you know, all became interested in musical theater, we were not the demographic that was like the typical mm -hmm. demographic for people who wanted to be in musical theater. Um, and, you know, and, and yet, you know, we all felt, you know, whatever this, this need was to be a part of this, of this industry. And I think that we were all probably lucky enough at some point to have had it, an experience in the theater where we saw somebody who either was like us or saw somebody who, or, or watched something that spoke to us that made us feel like we being who we are belonged in that place, right? Um, but, but, you know, and, and, and that did happen to me, but it did not happen that often. Yeah. Right in, in, in the in the childhood of, of, of and, and you know young adulthood of going to the theater, um, and you know I just I, I on some basic level I feel like if there were more people who had that experience there would probably be more people, uh, you know of you know a, a more um, here we use the word yeah, diverse but but I feel like it, that you could have a much more diverse pool of people who would be interested in the theater period right, right. and and if you had a bigger pool of people who would be interested. In you probably would have people who would get excited about being a casting director. You know, it, it all to me, it all comes down to that. Like I don't, I think it's very important in this conversation not to blame anybody for the fact that there is not, you know, the the, the sort of inclusiveness that we would all like. Uh, like I think that it is, I think it is human nature. Maybe this is not something that's a popular thing to admit, but I think it is human nature for people to connect to characters and stories that relate directly to their experience. You know, I, I think that that's just natural. I don't think that that's all that people are interested in, but I, but, but I feel like, you know, even though people may not like to admit it, I, I just feel like that's true. You know, when I see Asian American people on stage or an Asian American story, I, I do naturally gravitate towards those characters. You know, I identify with those characters. Um, so, you know, so I feel like, I feel like, I feel like in the end, you know, you can only, you can only blame the, 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 you, uh, the you know, like it, like you know, you, you you can only blame the industry so much, right? Because if you look at the demographic of the people sitting in the audience, that is not a hugely inclusive demographic, right? No, but I think and there's a part of us that have to start creating things that draws an audience that doesn't yes, absolutely. exist at the same absolutely. time, right? Absolutely, and that, whether that comes from producers or writers or theater owners, or right. I think we have to start creating things so that they have something to come, rather than expect them right. to start coming to things that's and exactly. then we create things for that's them. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So it all has to happen at the same yeah. time, and that's the thing I think that's so overwhelming, right? Because yeah. because you realize that the, that the issue is a huge systemic issue that has to do. But with, we are we are at a point of in time when the audience is aging and disappearing, and so hopefully a new audience is going to take their place. And so there are practical reasons why helping to create a new audience becomes an economic reality. So what's the role of economics in all of this, do you think, in audience? Huh. All of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think, unfortunately, it's the business part of the show business. It is a business at the end of the day. And you know, bills have to be paid. People have to be paid. And there's, that's the unfortunate part of it. We don't, it's not just about creating art. You know, there's that part of it, but then it's also yeah. The other part, and that's you know, that's not my forte, and so I can't really speak too much about that. But it's something that's a you know, it's but it's not necessarily an, an unfortunate thing. I mean, I, I mean, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. But, but at the same time, you know, it is a huge opportunity. I mean, if you were able to get, like, I always feel this way. If if I were able to just snap my fingers and all of a sudden, 
you know, Asian American people and like Asian immigrants all decided they loved going to musical theater. Yeah. You know, and all of a sudden they started buying tickets. Things would change like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, that, and that's, the, that's the power of the commercial side of things. Yeah. Right? Because if, if that audience were there, producers would realize, hey, you know what, there's money to be made here. Let's find some artists, let's find some projects that speak to those people. Yeah. Right? I mean, how to, how, to, how to get those people to come is a huge question mark. Yeah. 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 I think what's exciting about this like, new generation of writers and actors and, and producers and creators is that because of the internet and YouTube and all of these new opportunities to create, and the level of exposure that now is out there, um, I think that that it is going to change because a kid knows that they have the power to create something, put it on the internet, and then possibly there is a possibility to get for it to go viral and all of a sudden they are making tons of money because they're getting placements and there is that possibility now, right, for, for somebody young to create something. So I like to believe, and, and this is what my experience has been, that my peers have always been on board first. Like in school or when I was in college, I always felt like a support from my peers before I felt it from, you know, this you know, not to blame an older generation, but but the people that were older than me. And so I, I would like to believe that actually there's going to be a huge change in the voices and the stories that are being told. Because now it's just acceptable to make a video and your voice is heard and what you have to say is important. And now we have all these opportunities to do it on Twitter and Instagram and those social media outlets are they are influencing this generation so greatly. Yeah. So I really do believe that there is, there is going, we're going to see this a huge shift in in what is being created. I think it's I think it's a little bit of that and a little bit of what you said as well. I think you know in many ways, let's be realistic. We all live in a bubble in some ways in this city, and there's a whole lot of the rest of this country that doesn't know that a musical about Gloria Stefan exists right now Broadway, <laughs> or that a musical about the book, The Color Purple, written by Alice Walter, exists on Broadway right now. So it's it's about how do you reach those people? We even let them know that it exists, so then they have the opportunity to say, oh, I'd like to see that, or that's not interesting to me, but they get to at least the knowledge that it exists, and then they can make a choice based off of that. I think it's, I think, you know, it's not just about New York City where you can, you know, a New York Times article or something on Playbill.com, but it's it's about reaching other communities and other areas of this country that don't know things even exist for for them that they might be interested in. And just sort of tying a lot of that together, like I, I, I've been thinking a lot about this issue in my own sort of selfish way, which is that I was I actually was speaking about this on another panel that I did or a talk back I was in a couple days ago because like in my own work, like okay. I have like a downtown sensibility with like uptown ambitions. <laughs> but what's tricky about this is that, and like, and I, but I think about like the economics of all of that, and like the producers and the audiences. And I, and the odd thing about it is that I ultimately want, and I want all audiences. But I especially want the Tyler Perry audience. But and the Tyler Perry audience is clearly an audience that, like Hollywood's capitalized on, there's a ton of money there. But the Tyler Perry audience might not appreciate the downtown sensibility with the uptown ambitions. And so I struggle with that because I know that my sensibility has a broad appeal, though it also has a little bite to it, and so, and but I, but then when you sort of have to work in a, I say let's say Broadway model. I've never been in a Broadway model. I just been my my bar, but like it, there's, I can only imagine that producers sort of know know or think that they know what works or what doesn't work or what they'll take a chance on or what's economically viable or what isn't, and so with 
what Ali said, like it just makes me wonder if like does it just take one person sort of taking a chance on like the risky thing, which is what producing kind of is anyway, or is it more nuanced than that? And so I, I don't have an answer to that, but that's something that I think about just within my own experience. I'd like to throw out just one notion, and I don't know what we do with this exactly, but because in, in my life, I see things in a much more global sense. And I think we're still talking about the island that is America, and we're not even beginning to think about all the people in other countries who are writing musicals and who want to be reflected. And we have a huge group of Korean alums. They just did an evening at Joe's Pub called The Soul of Soul, which was just nothing but <laughs> Korean alums. And, you know, and they fuse with American writers, and they create something that will mean something in Seoul and in, in New York. And you know, we're sort of far behind in, way, in ways that we're talking about this. Because we're not thinking about the fact that it, it, it's a question of how do we embrace, you know, that include that much more. That it, I think it really has to do with, and, it, and it's also, I just like, I guess I'd like to ask this as a question. Do you think that there is a point to striving for universality, or is it about striving for the particular, which is the important part of reaching a level of inclusion? You know what I mean by, I mean, universal themes that don't exclude anyone and can include the casting of anyone but that can reach beyond the borders of the country, that, that can reach, and you know, why is it that these worldwide things are worldwide things, and is it power of myth, but what is, is there something else that says, how do we reach from, and I agree with you, Ali, but I think there is a step that we have to take to get from there into the hands of people with enough money or enough power, even at a regional theater, to say, let's take this thing and make it into something where the delivery system exists, or we have to invent a new delivery system. And that's the place where the holdup is for me, is how do we make that crossover? But, but also, going back to the question, I mean, is, is what we want, is what's going to lead us to where we want to get to, opening up and doing things that are including more people, more audiences, or narrowing in on specific audiences? Well, I, th I think first, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I, I think first of all, I think that, I think that there is, like, there's a choice to be made in terms of, in terms of deciding. Like I happen to believe that most audiences will relate to almost anything. I, I like I feel like I, I I feel like there are two different philosophies, right? There's the philosophy that says the audience buys tickets to this, and therefore if we want that audience, we need to give them this. There's the other philosophy that says, you know what? Actually, all audiences want is they want to see a story that 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 is a genuine human story. That um, that makes sense to them, you know, that is in some way moving, and that they are open to far more than than the the, the sort of you know the, the industry um, uh, uh, you know pundits or whatever give them credit for, right? Like I happen to believe that, and so so for me, I, like I feel like all certain. I feel like sometimes that all the audience needs to do is to be exposed to something that's new. Right, and like the way that I the way that I put it is this: if all you've ever if all you've ever been fed is McDonald's, then of course you'll love McDonald's, right? That doesn't mean that somebody who has been fed a steady diet of McDonald's isn't going to like some more main meal that you give them, <laughs> right? And I feel like sometimes we fall into the trap of believing that those people who love McDonald's will always only love McDonald's, mm -hmm. right? And that that ends up driving so many of the, the major choices without people even being that aware of the fact that they're making that assumption. Well, I think um, what the difference between that analogy is, though, is that you're, 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 you're choosing what that person eats, mm -hmm. whereas the, a ticket buyer chooses what they want to go see. Yeah. So, like, you know, when, which was when in any theater experience, that's what you get. You know, you, you as a ticket buyer get to choose yeah. whether you want to see anything at all or of what's available, what you want, you want yeah. to see. And so I think that... I think our, I would, I would like to say that I'd love to see us move to the, towards the more global, bigger idea. I think that that's like an end. I think there's a lot of steps we have to take to get there. And whether it's starting to include stories that speak to demographics that we're not speaking to right now, or telling stories that we're not telling right now that we can, someone can relate to. And it's, you know, it's uh, producers and writers taking a chance and putting themselves out there to create work that hopefully someone will take a chance on and allow us to expose people to. Mm -hmm. yep. 
I spent one horrible summer working at TKTS as flyering for Rock of Ages. And I, but, and I, it was an interesting experience because I literally was just on that triangle with all of these tourists and people sort of like coming and like deciding, what am I gonna see today? What's 80% off? What's 20% off? Whatever. And like my job flying for Rock of Ages was to get them to go see Rock of Ages. And so, and I implied every, you know, trick I had up my sleeve to try to get them to do that. Sometimes they did, they did, and sometimes they didn't. If they didn't, then we were normally encouraged to sort of try to get them, what else do you want to see? And it was fascinating to me to talk to people because like, some people will be like, oh, well, what's playing? Like, what's Rock of Ages? Like, oh, that's a little too racy for me. Then you say, okay, well, what about Phantom of the Opera? And they go, oh, I, I don't know about that. And so like, I started to lose a <laughs> sense of like, like the thing, the thing I started to become very aware of is that like everyone with the sh people, there's all the shows that they could possibly see, but those are all the shows that they could possibly see. So they just have to pick one. Yeah. And but like, who determines what are the shows they can see? Like, and and I don't have anything super eloquent to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> other than to say that like, well, we don't. I, I think it's, one of the just things, all this yeah. there. But yeah. Yeah. Gonna, yeah. In two minutes, we're going to take questions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think ideally you have a system where where you have a system where you have both sides. You have you know both the things that are the, the you know where you're giving the audience what a certain amount of it is giving the audience what they want, and a certain amount of it is exposing them to new things. I think that the problem, I, I mean, one of the huge problems we have in this country is that we don't have both sides of it. I mean, our our public funding for the arts is ridiculously bad, mm -hmm. and 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 I, I mean, it's interesting. My experience uh, working with um, with the theater that I worked with in London, um, like I've been working with that theater since 1999. So during that time, in 1999, um, the, the state of public funding for the arts in London, in the UK, was far better than it is now. You know, I have seen in the time between then and now, like I have seen the same thing start to happen in the UK that, was happen that, that happened here decades ago, right? Which is basically the, 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 the government saying, you know what, artists don't need this kind of public money anymore and we're going to start cutting it, right? Um, and, and thinking the, the whole line of thinking that, that, that says if something um, if something can can generate an audience without our help it, like like if there is a healthy Broadway then why do we need uh, a not for profit musical theater right um, and and in that the, when I first started working with that theater in, in 1999 the thing that that theater did that was so extraordinary is that the artistic director at the time decided, like this theater is in a district of London that is the most diverse district in London, one of the poorest districts in London, and what this, in East London, and what this artistic director decided was, it's ridiculous that there is so much music that is out there in the community and none of it is finding its way onto these stages. So we need to get those people interested in writing musical theater. And so they applied for this Arts Council funding for this huge initiative to basically go out into that community and find the people who are the hip hop artists, find the people pop songwriters, the, 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 you know, the poets, the, you know, the novelists that were actually really working you know, in, in, and, and succeeding in their medium and to invite them in to learn how to write musical theater. And along with that, to bring in all of these directors um, to learn alongside those writers. Right? And they started building this, this program for musical theater development, which has continued to today where they're bringing a whole like new kind of story right, that nobody in London had really ever seen before onto the stage with a kind of music that nobody had really heard before. And, and, you know, and now they're able to keep doing that just because they've been doing it since 1999. You know, they're, they're an institution now that, that the Arts Council recognizes and so they continue to fund them. But like you know, an organization that was, tr that, that was trying to do that today and trying to start from scratch, they would have a really, really hard time. So, I feel like I've seen, you know, in my own little, you know, the sliver of experience, I've seen the difference that public money makes. It makes a huge difference, right? And they were able, you know, that theater was able to, to, um, you know, to really build an audience for the kind of work that they do. They were able to transfer at least a couple of shows to the West End that never would have made it to the West End, um, including, you know, one show which, which was the first show in the history of the West End to really deal with the Black British experience, which was like in 
the early 2000s. And that's a little shocking. That's the first one in the early 2000s, right? So, again, I mean, I, I don't think that we're all, I, I don't think that we're coming up with like, you know, the solution, but I think that all of these pieces are a part of what needs to happen, right, to start making that difference. Um, so do some of you have questions that you, we have not touched upon? Yes. Uh, specifically towards uh, Michael and referring to some of what Robert has said, if you're looking for the Tyler Perry audience, which was more or less built in theater along the Chitlin circuit, and given your experience with booty candy, why doesn't that translate it? And more importantly, if delivering the work to the audience builds the audience, then why doesn't Playwrights Horizons have a whole slate of those types of shows now? Well, that's a really interesting question. I don't, I thought, well, this is, a, this is an interesting question because the thing that I, when I saw Booty Candy, which is absolutely a play that like the Tyler Perry audience could absolutely enjoy, and probably does, you know? And yet, the question I had when I saw the person I saw with who works at Price of Redmond, I was like, well, would you do another one? Can you do two? Like, there's this really interesting story there was, that I read in the Wall Street Journal a, a, like a month or so ago about, what's that play that's at the public right now that was being Eclipse. Eclipse? There was this really interesting story that that play has been sort of in the ether for a while, and I guess uh, it got passed on early on because of Ruined. And the reasoning sort of in the ether with the artistic directors was like, oh, we can't have two plays about Africa. Like, like, and, and that was like, a, and like, and one of them, I'm, like, I'm not calling that out because he was named in the article, but Tim Sandberg was like, he's like, yeah, we did that. That was like, we did that. Like, we said we can't have two. And so, so then I met Claire to Rise and seeing Booty Candy, and I'm, and I'm wondering to myself, prior, to, this is before even ever reading that article, I was like, I was like, oh, this is so great, and look at the audience they had, and it opened up a whole new thing for them. Would they do another one? Like, or will the, another one have to be the black slot three seasons later? Will it seem too much like repetition? Will it not like, and yet, whereas, the, and the thing about that that I find curious as a theater person who's seen a lot of shows is that someone will say, we've seen these two black shows or two whatever you want to say, but they will never say, Oh, we already did a show where there are these sort of like disaffected white teens, you know, who say dude a lot and like on some sort of like messy stage. Like, no one, like, they'll do an Adam Rat play next to a Sarah Kane play, next to suburb, a suburbia revival, next to, and like all of those plays, from my point of view, my very biased point of view, are populated by the same kinds of characters that I see. And not only that, because, it, because that happens, it becomes a, a tradition or a brand that is marketable that you can make money off of. So I, why, I'm not like pointing a finger at Players Horizons, but why not do another one of those plays? Because clearly, all these black people came out to see it, and they would clearly all come out again to see something else that was even the same thing or similar, or just as long as it was just as good or just as funny or just as moving or the music was just as great or whatever. I think that's like a real, a real consideration that these gatekeepers need to contend with. Do you have a Twitter person? I do. And this person, real person behind you. So you have a Twitter person. This that. person had this question from the beginning, actually, and it's it's gotten evolved. So they said, "Can we address racism in musicals, specifically the instances of yellow face in recent musicals?" But then on top of that, they said, "When does remaining faithful to the original material trump instances of racism?" I wish I could ask that person to unpack their definition of racism, but that's just my own goal. I think they're I think they're watching through live streams. What do you mean by racism? <laughs> <laughs> but that's a great question. Yes, yeah, so that, that is the question at hand. Uh, okay, so what is the actual question? The question is <laughs> Uh, it's two part. It's asking if we can address yellow face in right. musicals, but then when does I think that the, the real question, the heart here is when does remaining faithful to the original material trump instances of racism? Mm -hmm. So is that like? Isn't that like? Um, yeah. 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 Because like, like, I've been reading a lot about the issue in um, 
Makata. Makata. Yeah. Yeah. Although I've never seen it, so I don't I don't have a context for it. So like, does anyone who's seen it can talk to that? Uh, I've seen it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen the Mikado. I have seen the Mikado. I mean, the Mikado is a really... Because someone said that the, the Mikado Mac is racist, like, period. Which is that... I the mean, Mikado is such... A, a, I mean, it's interesting, because the Mikado is sort of unlike anything else that exists, I think, <laughs> right now. Because... And it, the Mikado is really hard to talk about, I, I feel. This is my personal opinion. Because of the fact that the Mikado is essentially... You strip away... If you strip away the... the, 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 the you know, the the surfacey, you know, Japanese culture that's in the Mikado. The Mikado is basically about all these British people, right? I, and that's kind of how they're written. I mean, the thing that, I guess I would say that, for me, the thing that's, that's, um, that's quote unquote offensive about the Mikado, um, as far as the writing goes, and the casting is different, but as far as the writing goes, you know, it's the fact that they have very jokey, sort of, you know, very jokey, like, you know, pseudo-Asian names, right? Um, and so that's kind of offensive, I suppose. And um, and what else? That that some of the music, you know, has a little bit of you know, pentatonic-y stuff that's going on. Um, but other than that, I mean, this is a very, very, very personal opinion. Other than that, I don't find that much that's offensive in terms of the writing of the Mikado. Now, the produ the production of the Mikado is another matter. You know, at the time that the Mikado was originally produced, you know, like you, you, people. You know, you know, British performers or American performers who would who would who would you know do a production of it, um, who are predominantly white would just you know get into yellowface, and that's that was what was acceptable. Um, I feel like today, yeah, today that's uh, it's not terribly acceptable. I don't think the post office is going to accept that. Yeah. And and you know and and so I do think that I do think that that. Anybody who wants to produce the show really has to um, consider that you know, very deeply. You know, like, like, are you going to do, are you going to do a production of it, you know, with that traditional, you know, makeup or not? I mean, again, Gilbert and Sullivan is a very specific thing because because the thing with Gilbert and Sullivan is that there is a whole tradition of doing Gilbert and Sullivan as closely as you know as humanly possible to what the original production was. The original productions were in terms of traditions. So. And so it's so it's very very complicated. I mean, it is its own. I I think the best thing for me to say is that it is its own thing. And and I think that if the Mikado is done, I don't happen to believe that the Mikado should be banned. Period. I think that I think that I think that there is a way of doing a production, and people have done productions of the Mikado where they have been sensitive to all of these issues, and that they've discovered you know new dimensions to the work by setting it in another period. Or you know, or and I think it's, it's a whole factors. other area of concern that we're not getting into, which is the reproduction of historical yeah, work. Yeah. And you know, we we always try to say that we look at historical work um, at the program so that we can understand where we came from and not where we're going. Yeah. And I think that you know, I think that you, you you cut people a wide kind of path when you're looking at historical work and the decision whether to do the historical work as revisionist. Or as originally done, um, I don't think necessarily is racism. I think I think it's an aesthetic choice, but I don't think it's really. It's like what I said at the beginning about not thinking about what we do with the past and what we need to do is stop reviving things and start producing new stuff, and then right. we don't have to worry about this. Can I say? Can I say one thing? I just thought of this in regard to the question. I think okay. I think part of my you are watching, by the way. yeah yeah. I think part of what my, I think part of what my initial response to the question about how do you deal with racism is that for, for me, I think that whether something is racist or not is something that each person sort of has to come to themselves. And deter I mean, I think there are things that we all, that we say that we all can agree that are racist, but I think that that word is something that like, often is filled with, there's so many things in it that like, it becomes, it becomes this dangerous of a shorthand. Mm -hmm. So like, the only way that I can talk about it, that question is, in regards to musical theater is in relationship to a specific thing that has always bothered me. It's from a show that, that and I'm only calling this out from my own, because it's the only way I can talk about it, and, and so I think the language is really important, is that I remember I went to see Avenue Q whenever it came out, and, there's, and then I heard the song, Everybody's a Little Bit Racist, and I remember sitting in the audience, smoke, 
coming out of my ears hearing that song because I, I, and I, wasn't, I didn't have the language to express it at that time, but I do now because of uh, something important. It's because I, to me, it, that song felt like something that only a white person could write. And I did not know how to, as a person of color, digest the, and I understood, but as a musical theater writer, I understood how that song worked and like what was, what was clever about it and all those things. But as a citizen, as a citizen of color, I was like, oh, this is bullshit. Like, I really, really, really hate that song. I don't, it has nothing to do with those writers or anything like that, but like, that song really like stuck my craw. And, but then I think about like, could that song be written today in today's climate? And I don't think that it could. Yeah. Yeah. Because we recognize white supremacy for what it is. And that idea that everyone's a little bit racist, from my view, comes out of that white supremacy, which is not a way of saying, you're a racist, but it is saying like, you have a certain privilege and those and that and that privilege is also the same privilege that put you on Broadway. Yeah, yeah. And just really quickly, I mean, going, going to what Sarah's saying, I think Sarah's absolutely right. The thing is that if there were if there were like Asian American casts, you know, and Asian American shows about Asian American people or Asian people, like you know, coming out of everybody's ears, you know, in New York, I don't think anybody would would really be that sensitive about the Mikado. You know, I think that part of the issue is that the Mikado is is there as, as an issue that keeps coming up, partly because it is one of the only things that continuously gets produced, right, that has Asian characters in it, right? Yeah. So first of all, I want to ask you if you've seen Barbecue yet, which is- I've seen it on Tuesday. <laughs> okay. I saw a reading of it last fall at the public, at the same, like a week before or after I saw Booty Candy, and I was like, wow, this is so great. It's not the same, but the S that you feel like, oh yeah, he's doing it, it's brilliant and great. And he's doing it at two different theaters, and perhaps that was a choice of his, that he wanted to spread his wings and go back to the public where he started his career, and opt not to go back to Playwright to Writings. I don't know, I don't know him at all. I just, but again, I saw Booty Candy and I went up to him and I got like you did that, it's like, oh, so great. The <laughs> barbecue is equally great, and I think you'll really enjoy it. I want to talk about uh, disability drink, because it's a thing that happens all the time, and it's not a thing that people get so, as offended about. There are pockets of people who get offended about by it, but overall, the industry in general, they have an answer for you, and the answer is we want the celebrity to sell the tickets, so we put the celebrity in a wheelchair. Your wheelchair is not the first wheelchair to ever be on Broadway. You are the first right. actress to be in a wheelchair that is on Broadway. And and I get it, and I've heard it from casting directors, I've heard it from producers, I've heard them say we need to sell tickets. Well, the understudy is that had this or that, but you know, not the headliner. And I go back to Viola Davis's Emmy speech which was, if you don't give us the opportunity, how are we going to prove to you that we can do something, or that we can fill a house, or that we can be a major star, if we're relegated only to small roles, or no roles at all. And so I wonder what Allie has to say about that, and just in general, what the rest of you think about why it isn't as, uh, I don't want to say important, because I think it's a very important issue, but why it isn't on people's radar uh, nearly as much? I think it comes down to what people are comfortable with. And there is, um, what I've experienced in being in a wheelchair my entire life is that there is something that disability does for people that like, it, 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 um, <laughs> it like, it just, it makes them question their own privilege. It makes them um, maybe a little bit uncomfortable that somebody might walk differently or speak differently. Or and that that slight discomfort is enough of a reason for a producer to not want to take a risk. That's part of why I think it's happened. It also has to do with history and the fact that like the history of our culture is like literally we were not even seen in public. 60 years ago, <laughs> like, I mean, there's a huge 
issue there, in my opinion. Um, and also, like, I feel like I can admit this here in this, like, small room, even though we're streaming, like, I won't be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, you can, but, like, there's a part of me that feels like I can't be mad. And I can't get upset about it. Because if I do, you then I'm... What's that? You yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. But that's also, you're good at that. Like, I also feel like... I also feel like there's a part of me that feels like if I get pissed about, you know, the fact that, like, the character of Artie was in a wheelchair, you know, yeah, and it's not actually in a chair, then it puts me in the category of being um, a bitch. Um, <laughs> like, like, oh, God, like, I don't want to, you know, offend her again, so maybe I won't work with her. So I feel this pressure to be okay with what's happened and just, but very clearly put on my blinders about what I'm headed to do. Yeah. And, and now being in this position of sort of like, okay, now I've done this. Like, okay, we've got somebody who's actually in a wheelchair on Broadway. Now I feel like I can speak up and say to people, you know, actually that's not appropriate and, and I wanna I wanna offer this, you know, people at this stage are break a leg, actually I won't say that to you. You know, it's like, wait a minute, like that's actually offensive, you guys. Like like, you know, you can say break a leg to somebody who's in a wheelchair, you know, and and it's about educating and I I always run that fine I'm talking a lot. I, I run that fine line of like you know, of wanting to be positive, but also like have this moment of like, okay, now we must educate, yeah. we must expose ourselves to new things, and one of them being disability, and those stories need to be told now, because what's happening is that our community is getting more and more angry, and anger never is going to get us anywhere. So, I mean, and and the excuse that I hear, you know, you're talking about like, oh, we need us, we need to start. What I hear is, we don't know where, we we don't have anybody coming in. You know, we we don't know where they are. We don't know where they exist. And we now have the internet, so there's no excuse. <laughs> you know, so so for those people who have disabilities that are watching that do hear about this, like, I always say this, and I say this to girls and women, and I say this to people with disabilities, and that. But I'm going to say to everybody, like, make your voice heard. Like, your stories need to be heard. You need to be seen. Yeah, and I don't mean that, like, take pictures of yourself. I mean, like, you, <laughs> like, your truth needs to be seen. Yeah. And because people are ready and people want it, they just don't know it. And that's back to our conversation. I'm done. Can, I, can I ask a question related to this? Yes. Yeah. Because, like, I'll be honest that, like, I, like, what you said earlier, like, these issues are not, like, seen along the spectrum of diversity. And so like, it isn't something that I typically think about actively along that spectrum, though I recognize in this moment now, and from now on, I will forever. <laughs> so like, <laughs> <Don't worry. laughs> but like, so but my question is like, if say you are a performer with a disability who is within this industry, who is say equity, does equity give performers with disability like a voice in any sort of way or not or are there like what are what are the what are the laws or what is not the, not just the laws place? but like it seems like there must I'm maybe not maybe it must not be they lobby for them yeah the are there courage? are there are they encouraging are they mm -hmm. are there groups within groups yes. like, and and if so are are those groups able to advocate or to be to push visibility to like I don't know like but I'm just curious does that yeah. exist because then there's that if you are say a performer who is in a union but then if you're let's say like non equity disabled um, performer like I don't I, who what are the who, who can be an ally to you yeah. and for you within this industry like I just wonder if those to what extent those things exist? Yes, they do exist, and, and are they um, helpful? Yeah, there's there's a committee with SAG and AFTRA and um, equity called IMPWD. I'm a performer with disabilities, and they work hard to try to create more opportunities for people with different abilities.
capabilities. Um, and then there's Alliance for Inclusion in the Arts, which is like, um, a, you know, a, a organization that works to find work for people with disabilities. But the the part of it that I feel like is needs needs to happen more is those those groups are working, especially Alliance for Inclusion in the Arts. Like what they do is incredible. They are somebody that you can turn to, but you know, they email, they email us these opportunities, but they're all disabled specific opportunities. And so, you know, I, I think it would, I think it's great for somebody who hasn't had a lot of, like, let's just talk about like work. Like for somebody who hasn't had a lot of experience, I think it's great to go in for law and order and play a victim. But I have no interest in doing and that's not my ego talking. Like, I really want to, I want to do role. You know, I want to play parts. I want to do roles. Um, you know, and I, I want to, I want to, because because those roles are sort of these smaller kinds of things. And and to me, I think what needs to continue to happen is these conversations about cool. You're going to cast a project. We have. Um, I think mean, this is just an idea of mine. But like, we have somebody to come in and have a conversation with your director, your team, about how can we include people with different abilities in this project. And it doesn't mean it doesn't necessarily has to be on stage, because what you're saying, like, bring in interns that have different abilities. It's the exposure of the team, of the industry, of the audiences that that we exist, and that we have something really, I think, cool to offer because. When you have a disability, your other abilities are then heightened. So, what kind of magic can you bring to a project? So, and we that's my Did you remember the town hall thing that happened like oh, a week or so ago? I mean, so the casting committee, CSA, had a town hall meeting with. Yeah. Um, I had a show, but I. There was like a big town hall meeting with where the cast community came together with the the disabled community to have a conversation about you know how just and tell us about. Your community, like, tell us how we're able to, to what's what's politically correct to say, what's not yeah. to say, like, how can we start to include you in things to start a dialogue with that community because it's something that I think as a cast community at large we don't have a lot of information about, and so exactly. just educating ourselves was as a first step that we're trying to. Which is huge and it's awesome, and I. And I wasn't love there, it. unfortunately. I was in LA for work, but. Right. Um, I think it's things like that. We just start to say, "Listen, I don't know about you. Tell me about you. How? Just getting to know about you will allow me to understand where you come from and how we can work together, maybe." So, do we have other questions in the audience? Because I, and the people need to leave. Leave. Is that okay? Oh, we're for actually people? we're at time. We have okay. to. We have. I hate to cut this time conversation because it's amazing. <laughs> but we can actually. Everybody has a Twitter handle. I think Courtney has everybody. We can keep the conversation going if you go on Twitter. Like we don't want to end, but we have. We have had time. But keep it going on Twitter. Keep it going, and and Courtney will keep record of it, and it'll all be on Breaking Character Online Magazine. So. Um, Thank you guys so much. It's such an amazing panel. Yeah. This was an incredible conversation. Yeah. Musical theater, which can easily be continuing this conversation. So, hashtag HowlRound, 2 p.m. Uh, it's from 2 to 3. It's going to be awesome so we can continue all this wonderfulness. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Thank you for coming tonight and thank you again. Keep thank the conversation you. going. And the uh,